Hi, this is Emily. And I'm Jess. And I'm Sandy, and welcome to the First Town Meeting. We're super excited to start this podcast. A little background info. I just wanted to talk about Gilmore Girls, so I posted a little wanted ad on Reddit of all places. And the very aptly named Jess and Emily both contacted me. I started watching Gilmore Girls as a child. I wasn't even a teenager yet, but I was obsessed with Rory. I wanted to be Rory. How about you guys? I got into Gilmore Girls when I was kind of a mid to late teen, so a little bit older. But regardless, Rory Gilmore absolutely shaped the person that I thought I wanted to be. And Lorelai Gilmore is the person I still want to be. And I'm really excited to have a chance to talk to people about it. Yeah, I um, I started watching around, at the time I think I was 13, 14, I caught reruns on um, ABC Family and just got obsessed with the show. Started watching it every chance I could, um, anytime it was on, because, you know, we didn't have DVR back then. And again, same, I just became obsessed with Rory. I wanted to be the girl who reads all the time and gets straight A's and and does all these great things and has this great life and it just looked like so much fun. So for the past three weeks, we've been trying to figure this all out, what we want to discuss, how we want to discuss it, and all the audio issues in between. We are novices to podcasting, but hopefully we're going to give you guys a great experience. So this is going to be a podcast for the fans, for people who are familiar with the show. We really encourage you to watch the episode along with us, but it's not entirely necessary. This is not going to be a spoiler-free podcast, though. So if you haven't seen anything and if you don't want to be spoiled, definitely watch the show before you listen to us. But we're not going to get too into discussing later episodes when we're on a current episode. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about the thousands of references throughout the show, the different books that Rory reads, all of the amazing fashion and some not so amazing fashion, and then of course the episode itself. We will talk about our favorite town's person of the week, um, which could be somebody from Stars Hollow or not, um, but essentially just somebody who stood out to us in that episode for whatever reason. And then we will also keep a running coffee counter for Rory and Lorelai's unending coffee addiction. We're also going to start each episode with a quick summary, except instead of a detailed summary or one that actually summarized the plot, I've challenged myself to make the world's suckiest summary. And instead of explaining just what the hell that means, I'm just going to jump straight into it. We start in a town founded in 1779, in a diner that's a hardware store and has a mug wall that will never be seen again. A man hits on a woman, and then a girl, who most definitely looks like a daughter. I counted five paintings of presidents throughout the episode, two of which were Washington. There's also at one point a gun in a frame, like in a portrait. There's a teen hayride at 9 p.m. on Thursdays, and bundles of sticks up your butt is a line said. The local chef cannot cook and walk at the same time without almost murdering someone, and later in the episode actually murders a Viking. We find out that the local bakery makes great round cakes. At the Gilmore Girls' house, there's a picture of a dog that, to my knowledge, is never explained in the whole series as well as a picture of a young girl in front of the house. Rory, the daughter, meets the world's tallest man, named Dean, and Lorelai, the mother, goes to a flagellation. And last but certainly not least, we find out from Lorelai's father, Richard, that when people die, he pays. And that was the pilot. All right, so the pilot. I feel like it's been honestly a while since I watched the pilot. What about you guys? When's the last time you watched this one? You know what? About a week ago. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I'm a big watch the pilot episode and then the last episode of a series person. So I watched a pilot episode quite a bit. Okay. Emily, you said last week. Last week, um, I took notes and then I started kind of speed watching it 
before we started on like one and a half speed, which is fun to watch because everybody walks really fast. <laughs> I would do they talk crazy fast then? Too? Yeah, it would oh, be ridiculous, yeah. right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I will say that going into the pilot, um, I had to like stop myself from just continuing to watch the series. Like, I don't know about you guys, but I think it's a good pilot. Like it's, I agree. Oh yeah. I have so much love for this show already, but it's like it's an endearing pilot. They really went all out with like creating characters, starting to build the idea of Stars Hollow. Um, you get introduced to a good amount of characters, and you know it doesn't feel forced at all. It doesn't, and there's a lot of shows out there where I feel like the pilot episode. You're like, well, you know, get through the pilot, and after that, it's really good, or even get through the first season. And then it gets really good, whereas I feel like Gilmore Girls just immediately picks up. Everything is just very natural. And in that first episode, you really do meet the main cast that's going to be throughout there. You don't really have a whole lot of extra characters um, introduced throughout the series other than, like, love interests. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that being said, I think that this pilot is also a really interesting look at... Um, when a show goes to pilot and the pilot does well enough to like get picked up as a show, but then they definitely make some changes. Oh like, yeah. Uh, the things that we see in this episode that will like never be seen again. Um, and character traits like, so for example, Luke, right? We're introduced to Luke right off the bat first scene. Um, and he comes across as throughout the whole episode, like this kind of. Um, I don't know how you would describe him, but like red meat will kill like mm-hmm. too much Weirdly coffee. healthy for a diner owner. Yeah, super and healthy, crunchy kind of granola guy. Even like not just Luke, but Luke's diner is just, it's a completely different place later on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I noticed, uh, I think it's the second time we visit Luke's in the episode. Like, they are at Luke's all the time in the pilot. Mm-hmm. Like, they don't eat at home. Even even when Suki is supposedly going to be cooking for them, we don't see it. Did you see the large That's... letters in the background of Luke's diner? With, like, a bright green yes. flame? Yes. Yeah. What was that? What did it say? I couldn't tell. I, all it, I, I saw it was, like, like, an A, a and a T or something. Or something? Oh, I don't know. I, I focused I honestly on that couldn't even so much, you. and I still could not yeah. understand what it was. I'm like, okay, first of all, Luke would never put that up <laughs> no. in his store. Yeah. The thing that got me is in, like, that second time they visit, you can see there's a beautiful white frosted cake in the front window. Who made that cake? It wasn't Luke. I mean, and it wasn't we Caesar. know who makes beautiful round cakes. Oh, right? well, the bakery. <laughs> I don't know if you heard. But uh, they're really round. Like, later on in the series, the front window of Luke's is a place that they plop themselves down multiple times. Like, it's not a display case. It's just more seating. Mm -hmm. No, I was just going to say, my weird little pilot moment was when Lorelai visits Emily later on in the episode. And she's at the front door for a little bit. They talk about, oh, is it Easter already? Lorelai's hair is moving right as if there's wind but the background is a static photo it is a green screen i definitely noticed that yeah. i but so if you pay really close attention to it cuz i that background image just like blows my mind because it just it's just so fake but you can still see like trees moving in the background a little bit just a tiny bit just enough to so like no they didn't just put a giant just poster just a poster yeah there. because it kind of I mean, seemed I, like that way it does. It looks like that. It looks like a giant poster in the background. Yeah, and I made a note about that when I was watching the episode because this, I think in the pilot, the way that Emily and Richard are kind of introduced and the way that the house looks and especially that establishing shot of like looking across, you know, Emily's point of view looking at Lorelai, you can see the house across the street. You can see mm-hmm. like the dumpy blue pickup truck of the person who lives there. And I'm like, this is not the picture of, like, extreme wealth. You know, like, that is absolutely Richard and Emily. Like, at one point, they're Mm -hmm. talking about buying a plane. So there is one more uh, pilot-related detail. And that is the living room. The Gilmore Girls' living room. Yes. 
did you guys notice that it's a circular place with like five windows and a side door? <laughs> they have a huge bay window that Richard is standing in front of, but I think my favorite part of it is when Lorelai walks in and she goes, oh, place hasn't changed. And Emily says something of, oh yeah, it's been the same for 30 years or whatever. And then by, I think, I think they keep the pretty same layout throughout the season one and then season two completely changes. You know what? That living room also changed, but I was actually talking about the Gilmore Girls living room. Oh, yeah. No. See, yeah, their house changes too mm-hmm. after season one. When I think about the Gilmore living room, I think about the couch that has its back to the front of the house. Yep. And then you have the couch looking at the TV, and that's where they, like, plop themselves down for yep. movie nights and when Lorelai's back is out, all of these things. But in this episode, like, the couch is, like, perpendicular there's like several couches there's yeah multiple couches there's a bunch of like antique Mm -hmm. chairs like where does all Mm -hmm. of that go i mean presumably into whatever prop storage they got it from but i'm curious if in episode two like right off the bat it's changed i haven't watched episode two in a long time i can say it doesn't um (laughs) because i paid a lot i paid a lot of attention um so like the whole entryway changes so like throughout the rest of the series um season two and on the entrance away kind of has two entrances into the house so you walk in the front door and you go to the left of the living room or you go straight straight forward mm-hmm. and you have like a closet or a bathroom or some unknown item there um and then you know right's the kitchen and left's the living room again on well, season one that left entryway is not there it's just wall and there's a piano there oh. first of all pianos are not cheap where in the hell did lorelei get a piano <laughs> i don't know where do they get any of these where, yeah exactly knick-knacks? But then at some point you follow Emily and Emily goes back into that entryway and hangs her coat up in a closet in that entryway. It's also a bathroom, no? I don't know. <laughs> That's fair. Nobody knows. <laughs> yeah. But there but, is, like Sandra was saying, yeah. that, or Sandy was saying, that mystery step, mm-hmm. right? When Lorelai has yeah. her hand on the door frame during her like fight with Rory, I think it is. Yeah. I was like, where is she? <laughs> where is this lowered section of the house? Because then later, you just walk straight out of the entryway, you take mm-hmm. that right, and then you're in the kitchen slash Rory's bedroom area. Mm-hmm. No step. Nope. I think the kitchen is raised. I think when you, I think you see an episode when Rory, when Lorelai is on the phone with Chilton, trying to figure out like the tuition stuff, she takes a step down out of the kitchen and into the living room entryway area. Okay. So I think the kitchen is slight. Raised, I have to say that's only in the pilot or only in season yeah. one. But you know that's how pilots are; they completely change. Um, you sometimes they're filmed like six months in advance, and then mm-hmm. you get picked up and you have to recreate a set. But you realize, hey, why the hell do we have that step in the first place? Probably don't need it. So yeah. I always find those things a little interesting. Well, and so one thing too is that you you read a lot about or well I read a lot about um this was really Alexis Bledel's first acting job yeah Yeah. so as obsessors with the show um it's mentioned a lot at the beginning of the series when they first start recording you'll notice Lorelai throw her arm around Rory a lot to like lead her to the set markers and maybe they kind of like figured out of oh make having them to have to go up and down a step all the time to get to the right part in the house while she Lorelai's dragging her along yeah that's a good point probably a great way to have to re- t- reshoot the scene over and over because they're going to trip. <laughs> I've definitely read that same thing, and I was thinking about that as soon as you started saying it. And it's so funny because, like, even one of the clips in, like, the intro, right? The one where Lorelai throws her arm around Rory, and I think it's maybe at the birthday, birthday and she party? kind of turns her toward camera. I think about that every time I see it. I'm like, there she is. Lauren's put Alexis in her place. <laughs> I would love, love to, like, just see an in-depth interview with Alexis and Lauren, like, interviewing each other. You know how they have those, like, actors on actors Mm -hmm. interviews where two actors will talk about, because I think it'd be so interesting just to see those two women as just friends who worked together for all these years, like, Mm -hmm. talking about Gilmore or talking about their careers. I think that'd be so fun. I agree. Between two ferns type thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, real quick. This episode, if I had to give it a theme, I would say mothers and daughters arguing. 
right? Like this episode kind of really centered around Rory and Lorelai arguing and then Lorelai and Emily arguing. Yeah. The difference is, or is does that... it center around Lorelai arguing with everybody in the Ooh, episode? <laughs> that's who, you're not wrong. Um, but the difference is, is that Lorelai and Rory make up at the end. Meanwhile, mm-hmm. Emily and Lorelai, not so much. So, with that in mind, how how was your relationship with your mom? Without going into too much details, I I can say I have a really great relationship with my mom. Um, unlike Lori and Ro- or Lori, Rory and Lorelai, um, <laughs> yeah. my mom, whose name is Laura, uh, she was in her thirties when she had me and I was her first child. Um, so I definitely have like an older mom. Um, but I have a great relationship with her. I definitely don't have like a Lorelai Rory best girlfriends kind of relationship. But there are certain things throughout my life that my mom has done or ways that my mom has done things that I think would have made Lorelai proud. Like one time for homecoming, uh, I was going to wear this little short black lacy dress um, and I was doing a black and red look. Mm -hmm. And my mom took me to Victoria's Secret to pick out a red push-up bra so that I could have my little red strap showing with my black dress. Ooh, scandalous. And like... That's just one of those things, like, I bet Lorelai would have been like, get a girl, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> How about you, Emily? So, uh, my mom and I are really close now. We we never fought. We never necessarily had a bad relationship. Um, and I I remember being really close to her when I was really young, and she was mom, and, and I was mama's girl. And then through, like, teenage years, we kind of, she had some health issues, and... Uh, My parents were divorced, so I spent the majority of my time at my dad's anyway. Um, So that wasn't necessarily the... It wasn't bad. It just wasn't great. Um, Now, she is, like, the first person I call whenever anything, like, exciting happens or anything bad happens or, like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think, Mom? Because I clearly can't do this without your approval. Me too. (laughs) Um, so now, like, my mom is 100% my best friend, even though there are clearly times like, Mom, this is not what I need to hear you saying right now. Like, (laughs) let's stop talking and move on. What about you, Sandy? So, my mom and I had, you know the argument that Rory and Lorelai have in her bedroom? Me and my mom had that argument about 17,000 times. And, um, that tone of... Hey, I'm not okay right now. Can you please just leave me alone? I probably said that a thousand times. Um, So it was a little rough in my teenage years with my mom. But then after teenage, like, you know, first year of college, going into college, I missed her a lot while I was dorming. And then we became friends. And, you know, she also has had her health problems. So I did move back with her and it's been a good experience there are times where she pulls the mom card and I'm like hey mom I'm in my late 20s I you can but at the same time I do have a great relationship with her and actually Gilmore Girls kind of helped with that we watched all of these episodes together oh that's sweet yeah I never I don't think my mom ever watched Gilmore um but she definitely did buy me a couple of the box sets. Oh, that's she nice. Really yeah. Them. Those are those Same. were expensive back in the day. Yeah, 40 they were bucks great or something. Gift. 40, mm. 40 bucks a season. Yeah. I remember when the whole series came out in like the giant box after it was done airing and it was like 200 some dollars, oh I think. And I was like, I want this so bad. And my mom's like, we're poor. <laughs> uh, no, I'm sorry. You already have all of the seasons anyway. I have a late summer birthday, so I loved getting, like, a box set of anything for my birthday because mm-hmm. it was, like, right before you had to go back to school. It's like, I'm just going to be in the bonus room under a blanket watching my box set until I have to, like, go to school. Like, don't bother me. I'm watching season four for the hundredth mm-hmm. time. Uh, my box sets back in the day were One Tree Hill, Smallville, and Gilmore Girls, which is uh, all WB shows. <laughs> 
The WB was like it was. They it. had it going. It they was really great. They figured yeah. it out. I mean, mine was Gilmore Girls and Supernatural, so oh, technically well, yeah. mine were even both Gilmore Girls related because I started watching Supernatural because Dean was in it. That's actually funny that you mentioned that because when I wrote Dean's name earlier, I was like, Dean Winch, no, no, not Winchester. That's the other guy. That is a different Dean. So speaking of Dean, um, I think that this episode does a really great job of like illustrating that first time that you see somebody that you like and they clearly like you back Mm -hmm. right that first look between Rory and Dean where she just looks at this giant of a man and he's clearly so into her we've already seen Mm -hmm. him gawking at her as she and Lane walk by the front steps Mm -hmm. Um, and he's like kind of making his move but it kind of got me curious about like do you have a moment like that from your past, like that high school crush where it was like, oh, I think, is this, I do you like me? Because I kind of like the way you look. It's such like a, a high school moment. Um, so yeah, do you guys have a, a moment like that you can think of from your past? I think the closest thing I have is um, I in middle school. And, you know, IMing and MSN Messenger was the big thing. Yes, MSN Messenger. Um, I was, I had started talking to this boy, he was a grade ahead of me, and he's one of the popular kids, and I was one of the, like, I guess semi-popular, like, mm-hmm. we're not, we weren't the nerds or the yeah. jobs, In between. So we were just, we just kind of did our own thing, um, and we, like, kind of started talking on MSN, and I don't even remember how that started or how I got his thing, um, but then, like, a month into it, I had developed an absolute gigantic crush on him, and... Me and my friends were hanging out in the hallway, like, before school started, and I was kind of facing out towards the locker, and I saw him walk in, and I remember, was really, he was wearing a white t-shirt and, like, <laughs> jean shorts. I and was like, oh, I, I don't like, really know if I have that moment, and she remembers I the remember, outfit. <laughs> oh, well, it wasn't reciprocated. Oh. <laughs> but, like, I, feel I was mid-conversation, I, I see him walk by, and I just go, whoa. And my friends all stop, and they're just like, what? I was like... Oh, uh, 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 not just, you know, this and just like started spouting shit out of my mouth. (laughs) And like my best friend at the time turned around and she's like, oh, it's Logan. Logan's here. He just walked in. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to. We don't need to talk about Logan's yet. We we still have like four seasons until we have to deal with Logan. (laughs) So like his name was legitimately Logan. (laughs) I love it. Um, I... Mm, I kind of have a similar experience, but in a different way. I really liked this boy in middle school. It was eighth grade, and we were picking high schools. Uh, I went to a private school, so I had to... There were private schools you pick, right, to go to high school. And a couple of my friends were going here. A couple of my friends were going to the all-girls school. A couple of them were going to... Uh, what they call magnet school, which is free. And I picked the one in town. You know, it was in town. I picked it because it was in town. Possibly also because my crush was going there. (laughs) Oh, the things that we do for silly crushes. Oh my gosh. So I relate with Rory not wanting to leave Stars Hollow High. Uh... Thankfully, the school I went to was still a good school, right? It wasn't like I chose a crappy school. But at the same time, I did kind of choose that school because of a boy that I then never talked to. Oh, no. There are so many, like, unrequited crushes in high school and in middle school. Um, And that was another thing I wanted to bring up was, so after Rory and Dean, you know, decide that they're going to go to Miss Patty's together... Um, he brings up, oh, how do you like Moby Dick? And she's like, wait, how do you know I'm reading that? And he says, I've been watching you. And he's like, you know, noticing. And I was thinking about that, like, with my adult, you know, stranger mm-hmm. danger brain. Um, and if a, if a man came up to me today and said, I've been watching you, I'd be like, okay, creep. Like, <laughs> leave me alone. But thinking about it 
thinking back to like my high school brain, there's not a boy alive who went to my high school or middle school who I didn't at one point look at and think, could we be together? <laughs> like, literally, <laughs> if you were a boy and you went to school with me from the ages of honestly like 11 and up, I looked at you at one point and thought, maybe. And then I thought, yeah, if he said something. And then they never said anything. None of them. I wish I'd had that moment. But I had a lot of Emily moments. I'd had a lot of uh, MSN Messenger chats that turned into mm. awkward in-person awkwardness and nothing more. Oh, I don't even think we ever talked in person. <laughs> I, I had one boy who I spent a long time talking to on MSN Messenger, like hours and hours. And then I like saved the chats, you know, how you could like oh, save yeah, you your could chat. Do that. And there's like literally dating myself here. There are CD-ROMs and also, I think, floppy disks that Yikes, might have that information also cool. saved on them. Um, but I, he eventually came to my house. Ooh. Like We set up this rendezvous to hang out. And it should have been that Rory and Dean moment, right? Mm -hmm. I had essentially professed my love. He had essentially been like, yeah, I'm into you too. Showed up at my house and... I have never been that scared <laughs> and anxious and awkward and it was so awkward and we just talked and it was so weird but I like I feel for Rory in that moment where a boy says like I like the way you look I've been noticing you and you're just like this is so foreign to me I don't understand how to process this and cakes I around getting a job yeah cakes around did I mention cakes around <laughs> um it's funny that you mentioned Dean because I have a note and I do know that someone in the in this call likes Twilight, but I have Dean gives me oh, Edward Cullen vibes. Yes. I like to watch you sleep, Bella. <laughs> oh my god. I'm the Twi Hard in case anybody was curious. Uh, hit me up at Town Meeting Pod on Twitter. We can talk Twilight. We can talk Gilmore. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. I think that Twilight really took from the things that came before it. And this idea of like a mysterious new boy in town, like mm -hmm. checking you out, it's always been enticing, right? Like even going back to like Pride and Prejudice, right? There's a new boy in town and he's scoping them out. Yeah. We yeah, you're totally him. right. So switching gears a little bit, I want to talk about the Rory Lane relationship. Now, the best friend relationship yeah. that every girl wants ever. Well, yes, yes agreed. Um, although justice for Lane, always, always, always. till I die. <laughs> I just, I was so torn between like wanting to be Rory and wanting to be Lane at the same time. I had that childhood friend when, and you think we're going to be friends forever, right? There's nothing ever that's going to separate us. We talk about everything. We are so close. And then high school hits, and then college hits, and you kind of lose track of them. And uh, th this would be a spoiler, I guess, but Rory and Lane don't stay that close. Although they are still in each other's lives, they're not close the entire time. So it's interesting going back to the pilot and seeing, you know... Rory is there with her while Lane is walking home and, you know, they know each other and, um, oh, I have a date tonight with a future doctor. How old is he? 16. <laughs> like, that's a joke you would make. Oh, it's a hundred years from now, which is just makes me feel old. <laughs> I definitely yeah. have childhood friends who I am still very close with. I think that, like, one of the things that you lose as you grow up is those like friendships of convenience right like you're mm -hmm. going to school with them every day you are kind of forced to be together like it's so easy to make friends at that point in your life um and it's almost kind of funny that lane and rory only have each other because you figure it's a small town they've been hanging out with the same kids their entire lives and yet they're just not really friends with anybody else um but i think this this episode is a very like, it's a lot better introduction to Lane than I thought it was. Like, looking back, it's really, like, you see Lane, you see her changing her clothes on the way to school. She puts on a Woodstock t-shirt. 
I did you know, see so that. You get this idea that she's really kind of this like rebel girl who's got this overbearing mom with a music obsession. Yeah, no, I agree with the music. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with the music. Um, Lane, I mean, she mentions Eminem, but yeah. the conversation beforehand was about rock music, so that was a little weird. But Lane does have like a really out of touch. varied music interests, like we see throughout. That's true. And also, at the time, Eminem was, like, pretty he, hot. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty hot. Who is the real yeah. Slim Shady? We still don't know. Mm, no, Maybe we'll we never, never know. <laughs> I will say, I never pet like, even with Lane's expansive music love, I would still never peg her as somebody who loves rap. Like, yeah, because a lot yeah. of, she does all rock or pop based. Actually, just mainly mm-hmm. rock based. Um, so to go into even those different genres. Vibes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely some punk vibes. But I will say that my introduction to Eminem was um, I was staying with my grandparents and they had friends who had a granddaughter who lived with them and they took me over to hang out with her and she, you know, brought me into her room and we were playing with dolls or whatever and she was like, I shouldn't be letting you listen to this, but I did get Eminem's new CD and she like played like 30 seconds of an Eminem song for me and so I was like, Eminem is like the ultimate rebellion. And maybe that's why Lane's into it. You know, maybe it's a rebellion. Yeah, maybe. That's totally valid. Speaking of the Kims, um, the sign outside of Kim's Antiques says Kim's Antiques. But when you go in the door, it says the place is called the Glass Chimney. Yes. Kim's Arts and Antiques. Yes. And I've never seen that before. I I never noticed it. Until this, like, when I first watched it, or not first watched it, but when I most recently watched it, and I was, like, trying to, like, dissect the episode, I saw it, and I was mm-hmm. like, that's interesting, and does not stay. No, it definitely doesn't stay. And, like, the glass chimney is not really a name that I would think, oh, antiques, you know what I mean? So, I, it's just curious that they, they named it that, even for, like, half a second, because I don't think it ever shows up. Yeah. So, uh, Sandy and Emily are both from more the east side of the U.S., and I'm from the west coast. Um, And so, like, little antique stores like this, we have them, but I don't think they're nearly as prevalent as they are on the east coast. Um, And, like, in that Connecticut, like, New England kind of area. Mm -hmm. Because I think that when you talk about, like, going to that area for, like, touristy stuff, like, antique hunting is, is a big thing. And that's partially just because that part of the country is, like, has had... Super old. <laughs> yeah, it's had people living there a little bit longer. Or it's had white people living there a little bit longer, let's be honest. And white people love to have their old antiques. I do love old stuff. But I I love this introduction to the Kim's house and, like, this dis- totally disarrayed mess where they have to yell to where each other you? to be found. The table. I think Which it's... Table? I think it's a little bit less messy as we move on because there's like it is, scenes definitely. where like they have the um, family meet kind of in that front area um, and the band mm-hmm. when they pretend to be a, a Christian mm-hmm. band, they're in that front area. I love Mrs. Kim. I've always loved Mrs. Kim. She's such a character and this is such a fun way to meet her with her inedible muffins or whatever she's trying to get them to eat i will say i'm very surprised in that first episode with like how strict they do make her for the duration of if she would ask is anybody pregnant as her first thing because just like on a normal school day yeah yeah (laughs) well and she's so like strict and stringent about it like i just feel like even the thought that even the thought about asking is anybody pregnant would be taboo for her um and especially like when Rory comes in later and she's like, we kissed and they can't, nobody mama got kissed by the Lord or something like yeah. that. Um, <laughs> so it just, it kind of blows my mind that the first thing that you really hear her say, anybody pregnant today? Yeah. yeah actually, yeah, that's a good point. She's like very clearly alluding to the fact that she suspects teenagers in the town are having sex, which I, I can't remember. Maybe you guys remember does sex ever come up between Lane and Mrs. Kim? Like, obviously, we have the whole Lane's honeymoon disaster that comes up later in the series. We um, do have the conversation of right before the wedding, Mrs. Kim comes in to talk to Lane, and she's in her wedding dress, and she's like, the man's expectation will start early. At the wedding, you'll have to kiss him. You'll just have to do it. Um, yeah. And I think 
past that, you know, it's not really between them. It's never really discussed. Yeah. But I mean, clearly, if that is the way that we see Mrs. Kim communicating about like a relationship between a woman and her husband, it is kind of wild that she would just throw out the pregnant line right away. Honestly, it kind of feels like a Lorelai line, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, Lorelai would be the one that goes, like, hey, kids, anybody pregnant today? Like, how is school? But Lorelai would say in a more joking tone. Yeah. And Mrs. Kim yeah. is, like, dead serious. Is anybody pregnant? Because I want to know so I can get him kicked out of school so she's not around you and you don't have access to that. <laughs> yeah. And actually, I think it's com- it's directly compared to Lorelai and Rory because when uh, Lorelai makes the joke about the principal... Right. Rory follows up with that and she goes, wait, did you do something slutty? Right. Yeah. Which is not something I would ever ask my mom. Right. Yeah. And it almost looks like Rory actually thinks like, oh, shit, did my mom sleep with the principal? And then we learn who, what, you know, the headmaster Chilton looks like. <laughs> oh, <God>. other issue. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also later in the series, um, like when Lorelai is dating, I think it's during the Max phase, she talks about how she, like, never has men to the house. You Mm -hmm. know, she's dated, but she's never, like, dated here at home, which would suggest to me that she's been keeping her sex life kind of private from Rory, or at least separated from Rory, which, Mm -hmm. totally fair, Lorelai gets to make her own choice. But, you know, it makes you wonder, like, does Lorelai do nights out and then comes home and Rory's like, did you do something slutty, mom? Like, That's an interesting relationship dynamic. It's just a weird question to ask your mom. And she asks it so, like, it's just normal. Nonchalantly. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And it's, I think, there are a lot of things in the pilot that are different, right? Like we've talked about. Um, Like, we see kind of, like, slapstick humor with Suki literally hitting a man in the face with a cast iron skillet. And nobody reacts. Um, Nobody nobody reacts. reacts Like the fact that you just nailed a dude. It's crazy because you see later on especially at the inn like Lorelai is supposed to be this incredibly professional we're supposed to believe her to be like incredibly good at her job she is fluent in Spanish right that is so wild does that ever come up again again? no No. and um Rory talks in Spanish at one point because Alexis Bedell is uh Argentinian right right so she knows Spanish so I, I think it's way later on um season five or something but that's the only time anything remotely the same is brought up well so during the male Yale ball um when Lorelai's trying to call and talk to Emily like everybody who's answering is speaking in Spanish and she's like no give me somebody who speaks English so like clearly they just got rid of the whole Lorelai speaking Spanish thing just dropped it because she the grammar is correct too I'm Hispanic so like when I heard it I was like oh that that's actually how you would say that kind of thing they did it so it's interesting yeah I, I wanted to talk about something that is in the pilot that clearly stays the same throughout. So the whole okay. show is based around how close Lorelai and Rory are and that they're best friends and they tell each other, each other everything. But then our first big conflict between the two of them is a boy. And that stays yeah. for the duration of the yep. entire series of just Rory is so uncomfortable talking to her mom about boys. And then... Yeah. When she, like, psychs herself up to talk to her about it, like, when we get into, like, the Logan phase and everything, it's, here's a situation, I don't want your opinion, I'm just informing you, and then, like, out the door. And I just, I think it's really interesting that they would have that kind of dynamic in their relationship when everything else is just such an open book. And I'm going to add to that, Rory now have seen, you know, having seen seven seasons plus a year. Which we will not speak of. Which is the, uh, the lost a year. <laughs> the <laughs> lost year. Um, Rory does, and how do I put this nicely? She sometimes makes mistakes, and they are usually based around men in her life. Yeah, mm-hmm. men are not to be trusted in the Gilmore world. Like even good men with good intentions. Um, they have big secrets like the man that we know best uh just keeps the biggest secret of his life from a woman he's about to marry for two like you can't months. trust men well and it it also speaks to how much you know how much did Lorelai speak or bring home like obviously didn't bring home guys but how much did she discuss that 
with Rory because then Rory mentions to Dean about the whole, you know, my relationship with my mother and the whole I love you thing. Um, that it's just, it's very interesting, the relationships with men. Like, it just never seems to be easy. I think at one yeah. point Rory and Dean's relationship was very easy for them, which was great. Mm-hmm. And I think it was a great starting relationship. But, like, other than that, like, none of the relationships and none of the men really seem to, like, be truly, I guess, great, open, trustworthy characters. Yeah. And you can even see that with Richard. Because yeah. that line of... Oh, Christopher's so smart. You must have got it from him. That's so mean. That's awful. I wanted to bring that up. So that was one of the other things that I feel like kind of changed in the pilot. I feel like the way that the pilot framed Richard and Emily, Richard was the key antagonist. In in the pilot, we see, you know, Emily is initially kind of like excited when she sees Lorelai. Like that initial emotion is like, oh, what are you doing here? Um, when they're sitting at dinner, Emily is talking, or they're talking about Lorelai's job at the inn, and Emily very proudly says, you know, she's the general manager there, and Richard totally ignores that and continues just, like, dumping on Lorelai. Mm-hmm. You know, Emily's one condition for giving, I'm assuming $50,000, I don't know about you guys, um, how much money it sounds oh, yeah, like. Yeah. She said there's a lot of zeros behind that five. 5,000 seems too low. 500,000 seems too high. 5,000, 50,000 yeah. sounds about right. Um, her one condition is that she wants a call updating them on her life and a weekly dinner where they get to see each other. Yeah. Which I wanted to ask you guys, is... $50,000, like if you needed $50,000, do you think that having to do one dinner a week and one phone call a week, would you be willing to do that with a person who is toxic to you? Because that's really the way that this this sh- show frames Emily. Mm-hmm. So I do want to um, clarify something. I believe it's 75000 at the end. Okay. That Lorelai owes. So I'm not quite sure. I think the five and the multiple zeros, that's another I think that's, that's just down, like the thing. down payment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But- However, thinking of that, like 75000 in total, f- for three years, every Friday, talking to someone who, in at least to Lorelai, made her life miserable. Yeah. Honestly, I don't think I could do it. I am for your child to go to a private school that they would otherwise <laughs> never have the opportunity to go to. I Emily is the mom in our in our podcast here, so Emily, I think maybe has yeah. a different yeah. I think you have the opinion best. than we would. Mm-hmm. <laughs> As a mom, seventy five thousand dollars for my child to go to a super prestigious school that could get her into literally any college in the United States. That while yes, I would have to pay that money back eventually, or at least in my mind, I would have to pay it back. Um, yes, that's like an hour and a half a, yeah. a week out of my time. Um, mm-hmm. to do that and to set her up for life would be my thought process, yeah. then yes, that would 100% be worth it. <laughs> well, and it's interesting because this initial setup, right, of we're going to give you the money in exchange for one dinner and one phone call, like the entire show is kind of the evolution of that bargain growing, right? Mm-hmm. Because all of the mm-hmm. things that happen – with Emily and Richard later on down the show, you know, Richard's heart stuff, uh, Rory living with her grandparents, like all of that stems from this one decision that Lorelai makes Mm -hmm. to go to her parents for money. Like if they had just continued their normal Stars Hollow life, they probably would have just been doing holidays, right? They would not have had this. Gilmore Girls, the show would not be what it was. This one decision it's kind of the jumping off point of the entire series. And I think it's a great way to start the pilot. I agree. Yeah. Um, as a child teenager watching this show, I thought the Gilmore Girls just referred to Rory and Lorelai. And as an adult watching it, 
It doesn't. It refers to Rory, Lorelai, and Emily. Mm-hmm. Emily is as much as a main character as the other two. Absolutely. And she's a big driving force for a lot of the plot points. I agree completely. Well, and so, and on that first dinner too, um, when I was rewatching it, I kind of have the have the opinion that Lorelai actually kind of starts the antagonization at that dinner. Like the first thing she starts, I, my notes just say, "Why does she have to immediately criticize the dinner?" So I think she. Like, they sat down at dinner, and she just started talk, not talking not talking a lot about how bad it was, but just, like, uh, the something Tatoes or something is too salty, salt. yeah. or something mm-hmm. like that. And I think that's when Richard kind of goes on the defensive for Emily, and, oh, well, and Chris's startup goes public next month. And, yeah. And I, I just feel like I understand at that point Lorelai is doing this for Rory and for her school and to set her up in life, but... Is it really the smartest idea to walk in there, like, immediately on the defensive and trying to start a fight so at least you can think, well, I didn't start it, they did, or something like that? Yeah, just, and I mean, it, even when they're on the doorstep, you know, like, Lorelai kind of, like, gets gets on Rory's case about, like, don't, don't bring our stuff in there, right? Mm-hmm, don't. Mm-hmm. You are going to be civil. We're going to get through this dinner. And then she's the one who's like, mm, the potatoes could use more salt, which, in all fairness... Emily asks Rory how she likes the lamb. She says, it's good. And then Lori lies like, well, the potatoes. She did bring negativity, but Richard, like, took it to the nth degree. Yeah, it was wildly inappropriate. Level. Yeah, no, I agree So, with that. at the end of the episode, Rory does decide to go to Chilton, right? Yay. So, I have a question. Because it kind of seemed like Lorelai is like, oh, so you are going to go, Right. But it had already been established that Lorelai was pulling the mom card, mm-hmm. correct? Mm-hmm. So do you think that if Rory would have been adamant about not going to Chilton, she would not have gone to Chilton? That Lorelai would have acquiesced? Um, I think based on what we see of Rory in the rest of the show, the pilot Rory is kind of one of the most rebellious Rory's we see. Uh, that is very true. She generally... Well, till season four. Yeah. But, Five. I mean, she generally is a, an absolute goody-goody, especially when we see her contrasted with, like, the Chilton girls. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't imagine her, like, refusing to go to school. Like, I honestly can't imagine a world in which Rory Gilmore, you know, like, crosses her arms and sits down on the porch and says, I'm not going. Like, I can't see that. What about you, Emily? Unfortunately, that is season... <laughs> yes. <laughs> she does that later. I can't see Rory not going, but even if she didn't change her mind, I truly think Lorelai would have straight up pulled the mom card. Because at this point, she's sacrificed so much to give Rory that opportunity by having to go to Emily and ask for money from her parents, something she swore she would never do. And then she sat through that, you know, disastrous dinner of her making, of Emily and Richard's making, you know, every, I feel like everybody but Rory contributed to that not great dinner. Yeah. And actually, Emily probably contributed the least of the three of them. Right. Um, she was like kind of nice in the pilot. Trying. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> she was trying to be in her daughter's and her granddaughter's life. Yeah. Um, but yeah, after, after that, I think Lorelai would have straight up, I don't care. You're going. Mm-hmm. Put your skirt on. I sewed it up for you. Get going. So uh, it is now time for Town's Person of the Week. Ooh. Who wants to go first? I can go first. Yeah. Okay. My yeah. Town's Person of the Week, just because I feel like it's the most stars hollow moment of the pilot, is Miss Patty. Okay, I yeah. just think seeing her at her dance studio, smoking her cigarette, talking and dishing about boys, it's like, okay, that's the kind of small town this is. And I'd say Miss Patty is my town's person of the week. How about you, Emily? This is probably going to be shaped by how often and, and how much I've seen this show. But honestly, I would probably say Emily, number one, because we share a name. Mm-hmm. Um <laughs> <laughs> but also because this is definitely one of the episodes where you see her truly wanting to be involved just for the sake of being involved. Um, you know, she's not the one that went to Lorelai and said, hey, can we give you this money in exchange? I want this. It was it was literally just 
no, I want to be involved in your life and I want to help you with Rory's school. And, and throughout the dinner, you know, she tries to, tries to keep it calm and, you know, make it sound like she is proud of Lorelai and proud of what she has done with her life since being, you know, a 16 year old pregnant girl. Um, I just, I think that she, she proved that she can be that person. Um, you know, whether we see that in later episodes or not, it's a different story. <laughs> so I wish I could give it to Lorelai or Rory since it's the first episode, but I'm going to give it to the unnamed cook that's constantly <laughs> saving Sookie. They are <laughs> putting in the work. <laughs> I want to know what the interview I, uh, process is. There's fire. There's someone gets hit with a frying pan. It's, it's just bad. What is the uh, interview think... process for a cook <laughs> at the Independence Inn? Okay, you have a head chef. She's absolutely amazing, but she is accident prone. She will probably break your leg at some point. She will most definitely break her leg at some point. She might burn the the, the whole place down. So you yeah. basically have to be like her little fairy that just follows her around and pulls this off the shelf when she's trying to reach it and, you know, stops this fire. And, like, who takes that job? <laughs> I actually am curious now, going into episode two, episode three... If those are the same actors, like, because if you yeah. went through all of that, there's so much stunt work in those scenes, right? Like, there's the the pyro effects with the the rag mm-hmm. catching on fire. There's the prat fall with the pan hitting the face. Like, those guys were working. They were working and moving for their money. stuff. They were opening ovens. They were putting vegetables in the place. There's like, so much like actual choreography lot. going on. I'm oh, curious. Yeah. Can you imagine if you were that guy? You did that role in the pilot, and then you got like nothing. You know, <laughs> yeah, nothing. Yeah, if somebody else got your spot. <laughs> so I'm curious. We'll have to watch for them. To be fair, though, like nobody in that kitchen after that has a, any kind of role in the show. Absolutely. Yeah. Except for the one guy who forgets to make coffee or something, or like makes coffee well that Laura like comments on once. I just assume um, that Luke snuck in and made coffee. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I'm I'm gonna have to agree with Emily that it's Emily. Woo woo. Um, although unnamed cook, rest in peace because maybe he dies. I don't know. Um, I unnamed do think it's Emily. cook. He's concussed at the very least. Yeah. I, I think that Emily really, Emily is kind of at her peak in this first episode. I have some things to say about her fashion choices, but I will well, agree that Emily can be our honorary because she does not live in town, first townsperson of the week, which I would never have in, in a million years have expected. Me neither. Yay for unexpected. <laughs> So for each episode, we are each going to have our own little section of things we're going to kind of delve into. Um, So I am going to delve into the books, the different books that are mentioned, that are referenced, and then we'll choose one book to kind of go over a summary and then maybe even discuss how that book might reflect on Rory's life or Lorelai's life or or how that might have shaped them. Um, So in this episode, I think we have five books that are mentioned. Um, some of them are just references. Lorelai references a Stephen King novel that she would rather reenact that than go have dinner with her mother or go see her mother. Um, so who doesn't want to reenact a Stephen King novel? Um, we have Rory reading Moby, Moby Dick, as mentioned by Dean. It's her first Melville. Um, the week prior when Dean was stalking her, I guess, um, she was reading Madame Bovary. And, um, I think those were the most mentioned that those were the books mentioned for this episode. Um, the one I'm going to go into a little bit is Madame Bovary. It's a classic French novel written in the 1800s about a woman who is so obsessed with the ideal of the perfect romance that she essentially ruins her life. (laughs) Um, so it starts with Emma, and Emma is young, beautiful, read apparently a story that just got her obsessed with the romanticism and and the specialness and the flighty and the fun feelings that come with love, and that everything should always be passionate and joyous and great and, and, you know, you're always on cloud nine. Um, and she ends up marrying a doctor 
who is he he was previously married to an older woman who had passed away um by stroke and she had been so overbearing and his mother had been so overbearing that when he gets into this relationship with Emma he's just so happy to to be free and be excited and and you know he's in love with her he's truly in love with her that he just thinks she's the greatest thing alive um and Emma is so enamored with him because she grew up in a convent (laughs) surrounded by nuns um that it's the greatest thing ever and they fall in love and they get married and the the wedding is over and she just looks around she's like why did I get married like all of the glitz and the glamour and the glow of getting married and being the bride has worn off and she's immediately regretting her decision and and you see this often throughout the book um in that she changes her mind like she'll start projects and then get over it and start on something new and this happens over and over again that she just can't keep with the same she cannot and this turns into affairs um which is to me absolutely crazy a woman in the 1800s Fran- in 1800s France i guess 19th century France would be the way to say it having affairs emotional and physical um to the point that she apparently gets sick when she's not having an affair which i honestly believe she just gets depressed <laughs> and just stays in bed forever um and it essentially ends with her committing suicide. So, uh, in relation to that, or to relate that to Gilmore Girls, or Rory is the one who reads it, um, I think it's really interesting that this this woman goes through life never happy long-term in a relationship unless it's just sparkly and new and shiny and this person is obsessed with her, and then she gets bored and move on, moves on. And you kind of see how that, over the life of the series, that'll kind of reflect in... And Rory, and not that she's always looking for something shiny and new, but that I feel like the men in her life, they never seem quite good enough. That's, that's my take on Madame Bovary and how that relates. The only person Rory doesn't cheat on is Jess. She cheats on every other one of her boyfriends. Could you, could you almost say that she does kind of cheat on Jess with Dean and the fact that she is obviously crushing and starting something with Jess while Um, she is still with Dean. No, I think she's definitely cheating on Dean. (laughs) She 100% cheated on Dean. (laughs) She never fully commits herself to the relationship with Jess. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always, there's always that Dean background nonsense. But yeah, interesting that we have a, a book about romance and romance failing as we get introduced to what is going to be Rory's first romance right well after we cover books with Emily you're gonna get fashion with Jess um and our pilot episode really has uh some interesting fashion choices in it um the first time that we see Lorelai she is dressed in what I think is probably the most norm core boring un outfit we'll ever see her in which is like this big soccer mom coat mm-hmm. uh and i cannot imagine Lorelai wearing that coat in any other season can you guys it was big it was blue it literally looked like she was standing on the sidelines of a soccer game like not a cute moment uh, she also was wearing a pink cardigan with an orange scarf, which just took me back to those early 2000s fashions when you could do pink and orange mm-hmm. together. And it was like still kind of cute. Pink is the new orange. Pink is not. What was it? Uh, whoever said orange is the new pink was deranged. Is that what Elwood says? Um, I was thinking of that. It, but yeah, that sounds about I was right. thinking of Josie and the Pussycats. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's With throwback. Rachel Lee Cook. Some other key fashion moments that I wanted to point out um, are Rory's giant white sweater, which Lorelai calls a moo. Yeah. Um, and that stood out to me as something that I think girls would wear today, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Big oversized sweater, rolled sleeves, uh, presumably some boot cut jeans under there. She wears it with, I think this is an item of accessory that kind of dates the show, a gold and black beaded rope choker 
Um, I had to go back and look at it a couple of times. I thought it might have been one of those stretchy plastic chokers, but that's very much more a Lorelai thing. Mm -hmm. Um, So she, yeah, she's got her beaded choker on, which was like, boom, 2000s vibes. I Uh, had those. (laughs) I never had one. I was a plastic choker girl. I did both. I didn't The other big ones that I really loved was just seeing the teens of Stars Hollow. You get such a mix of that, like, late 90s, early 1000s. Um, You've got grunge. You've got mixed denim. One of the girls who sits in front of Rory in class is wearing this denim shirt that's patchwork denim. Like, makes me think of Britney. Makes me Mm -hmm. think of Justin. Like, that whole era. You had wild prints. You had prints that had like words and like calligraphy on them one of my favorite things about looking back at this show is the fashion and shearling jacket alert did anybody else spot it we have our first shearling denim jacket it is the jacket that lane is wearing in the episode you see the shearling on the inside as she's putting it on over her woodstock shirt and shearling jackets will go on to plague the gilmore girls all of them just be prepared Everybody's got a shearling jacket. Boys, girls, old, mm-hmm. young, shearling jackets on everybody. Okay, I have to promote my ignorance here. What is a shearling jacket? Oh, so a shearling jacket is, it's that like faux, like wool, like the fluffy lamb skin. And generally you see it on the Gilmore Girls collars. They'll have like a button up jacket with that oh, collar. Okay. Lane's is just on the inside. It's a full lining, which I think would actually be pretty cozy, and it's supposed to be pretty cold in this episode. But they're Um, filmed in Burbank, California, so it must be really hot. A lot of layers on everybody in this show. In this first episode, we see three different bandanas on Suki. We see a black and white bandana. We see a red and white bandana. And my personal favorite is a black bandana with embroidered flowers. I said something about it earlier, but I need to go back to it. Emily was done so dirty in this episode. Her hair, everything. Emily is so old in this episode. If you were to take this episode, season one, episode one, Emily, and compare her against even something like season four, Emily, the woman that we see in the pilot is so much older looking. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think it's a makeup decision. It's a hair decision for sure. And the way that she dresses is very old. It's extremely waspy. And later on in the series, we do see Emily to have a pretty sharp sense of style. She's going out. She's shopping regularly. She's picking up new things. And so I think that along with her personality kind of being a little bit weird in the pilot, they hadn't really figured out how they wanted to dress her yet. Mm -hmm. She just, she appears so old, which is so interesting when we're trying to be shown that Lorelai is still so young, that Lorelai had Rory so young. Um, For her to be this very old matronly character was kind of off, and I think that's a good decision that they went a different direction with her clothes then and the thing that i will kind of leave this on is every episode i want to pick out one the item that i want to steal from the episode and put into my own wardrobe and two the best and worst dressed of the episode so of this episode the thing that i want to steal the most it's seen very briefly but i'm actively looking for this and i want to snag it off his body in the scene where luke gets the money thrown on his diner floor when Rory and Lorelai storm out which is so rude we've had off podcast discussions about how wildly rude that is he is wearing this oversized light denim shirt and it just fits him so perfectly he's got like a green Henley underneath Luke is looking like a snack we don't even see his full face I want that shirt I think the best dressed in this episode is Lorelai. During her discussion with Suki on the porch outside of their house, she is wearing a brown and orange sweater with a tiger graphic on it, which I think is so on character for her, doing bold, embroidered, fun things. And actually the worst dressed in this episode, I would say, is Rory in that same scene. She comes out in her Chilton uniform (laughs) And it is the most hideous thing they have ever put on Alexis Bledel. She's got a white shirt, and then over that, she's got this awful red and white striped button-up that if we had seen it on her just normal, we would have all been like, what is she wearing? And then she has her Chilton shirt over top and her tartan skirt on. 
Um, and it's just a mess. And I'm glad that it's supposed to be a look at me trying on my outfit look. Um, but yeah. I actually got flashbacks from that scene because my skirt was very similar to her skirt. So I wanted to be I a uniform it. girl so bad. It sucked. <laughs> One of the things that I thought was so funny, uh, going back to the uniforms, is when Rory is talking to Lane about going to private school and wearing a uniform, she says, um, I think I wrote down the quote, but she says um, she's so excited to go to private school because she's going to get to wear a uniform. Nobody's going to be looking at you to see what you're wearing. Everybody is just there to learn. Why? And I just, oh, sweet, naive little baby Rory. (laughs) I wore pants my senior year. And um, yikes, not wearing a skirt. Oh, my God, the horror. How could you? Uh, The one thing I want to steal, the outfit you didn't mention that I was obsessed with, was Rory's outfit. The red shirt, the skirt, tights, and the boots. That's yes, a the Doc killer. Martens black yeah. tight. Yes. And the yeah. backpack. I love it. The leather it. backpack. Yes. Which mm-hmm. I apparently she doesn't take with her to Chilton no. because we definitely like see her huge... with like like the Jan Sport style, mm-hmm. like heavy duty ripstop fabric kind of backpack. Well let's be fair, her Chilton books could not fit in that leather mm-hmm. backpack. <laughs> For sure. But it was a super cute vibe. There's honestly I have three pages of fashion notes from the episode. I could do an entire podcast just on the clothes. Say my favorite outfit of that episode would I I like the moo moo. It was good. But I think it that, like good. if if I wore that I would be so uncomfortable because like I have wool sweaters and I cannot wear them long term. Like I get so hot in them that I'm like constantly pushing the sleeves up and like I regret wearing it almost immediately <laughs> I, I think it takes me back to my child because my mom would wear outfits like that all the time like the big baggy shirt and the leggings which oh, yeah. when I was a kid the leggings had the little loop at the bottom that could go underneath yes ankle. the stirrups <laughs> so that it wouldn't ride up and I it just looks like the ultimate comfort soft so I guess if the sweater was a little thinner I will say a very close number two is Lorelai's suit her it is really her beautiful suit when she first wear at the Independence Inn. Like, she looks on point. Lauren Graham is just beautiful. She, she is, is stunning. She they is can both gorgeous. wear anything and get away with it. However, midway through the episode, we do see Lorelai in a brown and black, like, suit jacket that is kind of military-inspired. And I, I'm i personally not a huge fan of the brown and black together. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's very flattering on her, but... I would say throughout the episode, we do see a very professional side of Lorelai. She's usually in her workwear, which I think makes the tiger shirt kind of stand out even more because we see her so buttoned up and then we do see a little bit of her personality, which definitely comes up in, oh, I don't know, maybe the next episode? Yeah. Her funky clothes choices? We'll definitely talk about that then. (laughs) To be continued. Yeah. So the reference of the week. Now, obviously, I could have gone with Britney Spears or RuPaul who we know, right? They're still relevant in 2021. Very relevant in 2021. Yeah. Which is really impressive. Um, Especially Brittany (laughs) and RuPaul. They're both super, both of them. But I wanted to go with a reference that I didn't understand. And I've watched this pilot millions of times. And you're going to have to turn into Flojo to get away from me. Never made sense to me. I caught that, and I didn't know it either. I'm excited to hear what that means. I have it on my notes, like, in all caps, reference, Flojo? What is So, Flojo is the nickname, like a J-Lo-style nickname, of a woman named Florence Joyner, who was, and still is, the fastest woman of all time. Uh, She holds records Mm -hmm. for, uh, the world records for both the 100 and the 200 meters, she was a person of color who broke barriers and went to the Olympics. Like, she was amazing. Unfortunately, she passed away when she was 38 um, oh, wow. in 1998, which would have been about two years before this episode. So, like, I had never heard of her before. And to be fair, I would have been six or seven at the time. So it's not really something I was keeping track of. But I'm glad I've heard of her now. Like, I, mm-hmm. I never would have known about this lady and I'm really glad because I looked her up and she was apparently amazing so that's awesome I'm really glad that you picked that one because I genuinely like I was watching the episode and I was like Flojo 
like, should I know that? It sounds like something you should know. And I'm glad that I know who she is now. She sounds like an incredible person. Yeah. Yeah, On my notes, that is the one like reference that I was like, what is this that I actually wrote down? So I'm, that was the perfect choice. So uh, to finalize this podcast, I wanted to talk about Lorelai and Rory's coffee intake. Rory had three cups of coffee. Acceptable. It's fair. Yeah. It's fair. Four I cups? mean, well, sips. <laughs> sips. She does leave at least twice. But Lorelai, Miss, Miss Gilmore, had nine cups of coffee in this episode. Yikes. I have a question on that one out of pure yeah. curiosity. That nine, does that include the five that she mentions to Luke in the very beginning, or is that just what we see on screen? That does include the five before. That is true. Okay. Four on screen, five off screen. And all of Rory's happen on screen. That's so much wow. coffee. That's still just a lot of coffee. <laughs> That's a lot of coffee. And if you, the listener, think that's a lot of coffee maybe not a lot of coffee do you drink nine cups a day do you drink no coffee we would love to hear from you in future episodes we're going to have a segment called stars hollow speaks and we would love to hear about you and your experience with the gilmore girls um what you love about it what you don't like about it you can make it specific to the episode we're going to be talking about which in this case will be episode two or you can talk about something just broad about the show in general um and at the tail end of our podcast here we will give you all of our social media handles. I hope you guys enjoyed. This was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun with you guys. I'm so glad I picked you guys. I feel like you guys came to me like <laughs> we came together in such a nice way. And I really have high hopes for this. I hope everyone has enjoyed. Um, Emily, do you have anything you want to add? I just have to say I'm so excited to do this. I love that I have two new accidental besties um, from the internet, (laughs) which is always safe, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, we're fine. I'm so excited just to be able to talk about this show that's had such a huge impact on my life, Um, whether in small ways or big ways. There there hasn't been somebody that I've been really able to discuss long term and discuss different things from the show that influenced me in some way. Um, so I'm just really excited to be able to do that. And then also to see how that how the show's affected other people as well. You know, okay. who has similar experiences, different experiences, different opinions. It just I think this show brings up so many great talking points and also highlights a lot of issues in T V and different eras different times i just i think it'll be a lot of fun i agree so that's the first episode join us for the next one please (laughs) hey this is future jess here i want to thank you once again for tuning in to our first episode of the town meeting podcast we'd love to hear from you we'd love to hear your thoughts about all things gilmore So please reach out to us on Twitter and Instagram at townmeetingpod or send us an email. It's ggtownmeeting at gmail.com. Once again, that's gg, like Gilmore Girls, townmeeting at gmail.com. We can't wait to hear from you and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye!